Good morning, Breakfast Clubbers and guests. Welcome. Today, we are going to be doing a special presentation that we like to do to share our speakers uh, and members of our club with everybody. This is the new kids on the block, our newest members who have joined the club get an opportunity to not talk about their business necessarily, but more so to give us some fun information about themselves so we can learn a little bit more about them. So today's guest and member or guest speakers, but members in our New Kids panel are Dr. Richard Chen and Paul Coleman. So I'm going to start off with Dr. Richard Chen from Petaluma, California, and Dr. Chen, go ahead and take the stage. Sure, uh, and uh, feel free to give me feedback as I go along. I'm not used to this so far. Um, I guess uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, my life story and, uh, you, and tell me what, what you think. Uh, uh, I was uh, actually born in Taiwan and uh, I, born, I was born in Taiwan. And um, for the first seven years of life, I was raised by my grandparents uh, because my parents came over to the United States and so when I came over at age seven to the United States in New York, um, I, I, I found a new family. I never saw my parents or uh, brothers before I came at age seven. So when I came over at seven, I, was, I had parents and two younger brothers. Uh, so that was a little bit different for me. Uh, and sort of uh, spent uh, 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 my life in uh, New York, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, let's see. I went to, uh, I went to, uh, I was trying to, uh, my, my father is a physician, so I tried to sort of uh, uh, continue that trend. So I went to a six year uh, college and med school in uh, upstate New York. Uh, and then let's see what I would say. Uh, so that, that was very interesting because it's, um, it's sort of, you work all the time, but anyway. But anyway uh, otherwise I would sort of say is that the, after that, let's see, get some notes there. Uh, so I, when I, after, I, after college, I did, uh, I, I was, I wasn't sure what, wasn't sure what I wanted to do with, with, with myself. So I did a year of traveling. Uh, I traveled across the United States. Uh, I traveled across, you know, uh, I went to, uh, Arizona. I went to Illinois. I went to Tennessee. I went to Maine. I went to New Jersey. Um, so that's just to get a better idea of what life was like. Uh, cause I've been uh, studying all this time with uh, college and med school and stuff. Um, and then uh, after that, I settled in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I worked in a community health center for about uh, 14 years, uh, more of an uh, Asian, uh, Asian thing. Unfortunately, I don't speak any uh, uh, Chinese since I lost that skills. Uh, so it was a little bit different uh, uh, going teaching, uh, uh, helping uh, Asian people when I didn't, didn't know that, those skills. Um, and then after that, I sort of went to... Uh, uh, after in community health center is kind of a tough, it's kind of a, a tough being community health center because it's sort of like, you know, you deal with people who have a lot of health issues and socioeconomic issues. So I got burnt out twice in that, during that time period. Uh, and so I decided to change in, uh, uh, change in, 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 in environment. So I worked for a, uh, something called a Harvard Vanguard in, in the East coast, which is sort of like similar to like Kaiser Permanente in the West coast but it's, it's on the West Coast, in the East Coast anyway, so. So, and, uh, and then from there, uh, I was like, that's when I saw it, I got interested in, in more integrated medicine. And so um, Harvard Vanguard, like Kaiser Martin, they had, had more money, so I was able to use their, their uh, continuing education credit uh, monies to help me sort of get my integrated medicine uh, education. And so I would say that, and then uh, let's see. Am I going, is this okay? Or should I, what, what am I doing? What, what I'm supposed to be doing? It's good. Oh, keep going. If you've got more. Yep. I did. So then from there, you know, after, after I did the, uh, after I did, like I spent four or five years at uh, Harvard Vanguard and then I got my, I got credentialed as a functional medicine doctor and stuff. And so then I sort of joined the first integrative medical practice in, in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, that was really interesting. Unfortunately, the, it was started by somebody who had no business experience. So, the or very little business experience, so unfortunately the the business went under. Um, so that was kind of a interesting experience as a physician to have a be lose your job because of bankruptcy. Um, and then so there was a couple of years of uh, of not 
knowing what was going on. I was trying to, I was traveling like a couple hours to go to a job just because there was, there was no job nearby that I wanted to go to. Um, and then we searched for, we were looking, I was looking for a job in California because uh, my, my, my in-laws are in California. And so after a couple of years search, you know, I looked at jobs in Texas and stuff and then found a job in California. So I've been here in California since uh, uh, 2017 uh, and um, it's been good. I got a chance to open my own practice at the beginning of this year. And so it's been a growing experience and um, it's been great meeting you guys. And uh, I think that's what I have to say. If, uh, if people want to ask more questions, uh, that's what I have so far. Okay, great. You uh, open it up for questions. Unmute and ask questions. Now you have a daughter too, right? So yeah, yeah I have a 14-year-old daughter. Um, and uh, so there was a she was a tough considering the change from uh, from Massachusetts to California, but she's uh, done well and she's doing well in high school. She's part of uh, doing a, a cross country and track team and stuff. So uh, uh, maybe yeah. Uh, I think my, 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 my uh, I maybe plug in my, my computer. I realize my computer is going down. Hold on. Oh, hey, you can't leave. No, let's <laughs> talk about it. Yeah, right in the middle. <laughs> Speaker walked off the stage. But that's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Boy, we've made an impression, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I, 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 want, I didn't want the computer to go down and then it would be like, then they would have no speaker at all. So, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What what does integrated me medicine mean exactly? Uh, so I mean, I, I, I was trained as a as a family doctor, and but what I would sort of say is that you know I realize there is the there is medicine can be helpful uh, in terms of you know surgery and the different things there, but I would say chronic disease is not really uh, served well by regular medicine. So what I did is I learned more about different kinds of medicine. So I started doing. I learned about you know uh, biochemistry of the body, so I know the physiology of the body really well. Um, I learned more about you know in terms of genetics. Uh, I learned about acupuncture, I learned about homeopathy. So I sort of fuse I sort of fuse a lot of different, different versions of medicine together, and um, and actually came up with a model for why chronic disease exists, which is, is listed in my book uh, that I that's called New Way to Health. And so what I find is integrative medicine is a more better way to address chronic disease whether people are tired, whether people are anxious or depressed, all that stuff there. Because, you know, if you deal with the body as a whole, rather than say, okay, well, you have a specific issue, you need specific medication, you don't, you don't get as much benefit as, whereas if you look at the, the whole body as a whole, then you get a lot better uh, 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 results there. And so that's, that's what I've been doing because I see the results so, for people so who I take. That's what, it, that's what I do, so. Hey, Alan? Richard. I have uh, two questions, Richard. Sure. Uh, one, <clears throat> one uh, question yep. is what, what, what's the name of the medical school you went to in uh, upstate New York for yep. six years or whatever? And uh, do you take Medicare? Yeah, so I, I, I went to uh, the uh, Ronsley Polytechnic Institute up in uh, Troy, New York. And then I, there was a two years of, of undergraduate college, then four years of med school at Albany Medical College. Um, and so... Um, I graduated at the top of the class in, uh, in Albany Medical College. And so right now, the, the, for integrative medicine, it's pretty different things than, than, uh, than regular medicine. So for that reason, I don't take insurance. I provide super bills so that people can sort of like get reimbursed by insurance companies. Um, so for Medicare, I would sort of say I can write labs and, and order labs which could be covered by insurance. Uh, but Medicare probably would not reimburse very much because it's a, uh, you know, just wouldn't probably so. And your practice is in Petaluma, right? Right. So right now I, I've been doing a, a, a combination practice, mostly like a, because of the, the COVID thing, I was able to start a home office practice. Um, and so I can do, um, I do telehealth, but also do in-person uh, uh, visits because I take care of stuff like, you know, arthritis or pain or stuff like that. And so it's been an interesting, it's, it's been good because, you know, uh, my, 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 my the daughter in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Santa Rosa for school, we have a pretty really flexibility for time-wise, so it's been good in terms of um, taking care of school and everything by working from home and stuff. So, and Hugh Tuck you raised your hand. Richard, yeah, there's a show on Dr. Oz yesterday, which is sort of up your line. 
they said that uh, a lot of back pain is actually not pain at all. It's just your, your brain reacting to certain stimuli and telling you that you have pain. And they had people on there that had been in pain for 30 years. And just by talking them through it, they, they, they're cured. Yeah, I mean, I, I would sort of say, yeah, I mean, I think that's based on Dr. Sarno's work. But I would sort of say there's, there's different things that there's, I found that there's, you know, it could be stress related, it could be mental health related. Uh, but I found stuff related to like neurotherapy where there's, it started in Germany where you can treat the nervous system using injections or other things. And it's pretty remarkable how there are a lot of things that can be done for pain other than just, you know, uh, medications or surgery and stuff. So it's been, it's been interesting um, doing, doing with that. So I believe um, B Betty has a question. I see Anastasia's hand and Susan's hand. So Betty, why don't you go first? Oh, actually, I don't have a question. Oh, I'll think of one, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK, moving on. Anastasia. Uh, I have two questions. So I'm curious about why Petaluma, because I'm from Petaluma. I'm up in Oregon now. Uh, but what what drew you to that particular town? And and I'm also curious, I was going to ask you what school your daughter is going to, because I went to my last two years of high school in Petaluma, but you mentioned Santa Rosa. So I'm just I mean, these are personal questions. It's OK sure. if you don't want to answer them. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think the reason uh, we, we lived in Petaluma is because uh, my sister-in-law is in San Francisco and we wanted someplace close to San Francisco. Um, and, you know, we lived for the first couple of years, we lived in Santa Rosa, actually, mm. um, when, when they had wildfire risk there and stuff. Mm. But uh, I thought we wanted Petaluma because it's like a nice town. Uh, it's like a, the best downtown I ever lived in for a while. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's close to San Francisco. So that's why we moved Petaluma. It's a nice town. I, I really like it. Um, and uh, we, and we our, our, daughter, our daughter goes to a, a, a Catholic school up in, uh, in, uh, in Santa okay. Rosa, so that's why we chose out there, so. Thank you. All right, and then uh, let's see, what else? We've got uh, Susan. Susan Rowan, you're up next. Well, I'm, I think your personal story is so very interesting, Dr. Chen. Um, the idea that you lived with grandparents, came over here at seven, and then all of a sudden you had this family and brother and sisters. So I assume you spoke uh, Chinese when you lived with your grandparents, but you say you don't speak it anymore. Did you lose it? Did you not keep up with it? Yeah, Is your I, daughter learning it? it the, the, the thing which, which I, I sort of uh, examined this a lot is because, you know, my father and mother were first generation immigrants as, as was I. And so when I came over at age seven, they wanted me to acclimate to the United States. So they wanted me to speak English. So they would speak to me in like our native language is Taiwanese, but I would answer back in, in English. And so I was a faithful student in terms of I learned, I learned to speak English. And so I, mean, I, I did what my parents expected. So I learned English and I learned it so well that I forgot my, my other skills because that's not was what, what was required of me to, to speak that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely when you know, we, we tried to have my, do my daughter at some point learn more Chinese than I did, because <laughs> we put her in immersion China, you know, kindergarten and daycare. And so she learned more Chinese. Unfortunately, she doesn't have much access to use to use Chinese too, so she lost her skills too. So we're probably about, about the same level of Chinese at this point there. So, yeah. so. your story is one that's very common among first generation, yeah. where people yeah. said we want you to be an American and learn English, and we lost some of our native languages. But I, I think that that's part of your story, and living and then coming here at seven and having a family, I think would add to whatever you write, because there's so many peels of that onion. That's just yeah. my thought. Yeah, no. Thank I, you. I mean, I think definitely people who are like second generation or further, it's like, well, you know, I wish my parents had taught me my, kept me my native language, but usually it's the, it's the, the further generation, you, you have that knowledge and to know that when you're first generation, you're like, no, 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 you have to acclimate, you have to acclimate, you have to acclimate, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I'm gonna use it up though. Very cool. So, Dr. Chen, what uh, do you like to do for fun when you're not uh, working? And uh, you know, uh, I have uh, two two main main interests. Uh, one thing is kind of interesting. It's kind of uh, I think I I think I would consider myself a nerd because I enjoy reading a lot. Uh, I enjoy a lot reading about medicine. I enjoy reading about the body and stuff. So I that's why I keep on doing the integrated medicine because I like learning more and more. Um, but that, the other thing that's which is not so nerdy is I do a keto. Um, so that's a Japanese martial art, and I've been doing it for <clears throat> 10 years or so. Um, I'm not very coordinated, so I don't do very well in the, in the martial art, but it's fun doing it. 
And so it's maybe it's good doing something that's not you're not, you're not good at because you sort of get the uh, awareness that uh, it won't it won't raise my ego too much, but it's fun doing it. So good, cool, <laughs> excellent. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Chen? I, I do have one, um, Dr. Chen. What um, now? What part of Taiwan were you from, or your family from? I, I was it's more. I was born in Wenlin, Taiwan. That's, that's central Taiwan. Okay. Uh, it was a uh, it was kind of an interesting experience because. Um, my grandparents owned a, a, a hotel, so I lived in a hotel for <laughs> seven years of my life. So that was pretty interesting. Oh, wow. And was that and was your family native Taiwan, or were they from mainland? And did the, the, the I, I, think, I think they've been mainland. Uh, they've been uh, Taiwanese for for a couple of generations. They're not native Taiwanese, but there was a couple of generations. So they, they, from from what I know, um, there was maybe they were back in mainland Taiwan, but not, not am I aware of. I think we're we were Taiwan for a couple of generations at least. Like that so. Fascinating. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. I think Tony, let's uh, let's move on to Paul Coleman. All right. Well, I think Betty had her hand, just raised her hand. So Betty, real quick. Just very quickly. Um, thank you for your presentation. How do you find your, or how do your clients find you? Uh, I, I think, I mean, mostly at this time, it's mostly a, a word of mouth. Uh, I mean, the, and the, uh, so if, I, if one patient does well, they, they, they tell other patients there and stuff. I mean, the book is a, another way of doing there. Um, I also found out, I mean, I have a couple, I'm part of so several organizations. You know, I'm part of Institute of Functional Medicine. I'm part of Walsh Institute, which treats depression, anxiety, using vitamins. Uh, I'm part of like a, a restored formulation we use herbs. Um, so I'm part of several different organizations there. And so those kind of provide feeders for myself there and stuff, so. Thank you. Yep. Okay. When we started uh, in the pandemic, uh, you know, the club, Golden Gate Breakfast Club was a local San Francisco organization with mostly members from the San Francisco Bay Area. But uh, thanks to COVID, we've actually been made into a new international club. And one of our international members is Paul Coleman from the Turks and Caicos. So right now I'd like to introduce Paul Coleman. Take it away, Paul, you're on stage. Education is wasted on the young. That's um, a quotation from George Bernard Shaw. I think it's something that I wanted to give you. My interpretation of education is wasted on the young. I had an unremarkable school career. If, in fact, if I said to you, unremarkable, I think I'm being very kind. I think in truth, really, it was... I was hopeless. I was hopeless at school. I didn't want to study. I couldn't see why you had to study. I couldn't see the benefit of, of studying history and geography and mathematics and such like. All I did when I was a schoolboy, as a teenager, I played cricket. Now, you're all probably looking and thinking, what's this cricket? Well, cricket is a game that the English, English invented. You play the game over five days. There might not be a winner at the end of five days, and yet it could be the most exciting five days of sport that you could ever imagine. Let me tell you, I would say to you, I have, there'll be very, very few people in this audience who will understand how exciting that somebody could find a game of cricket is. But I've got every sympathy for those who think, what's all this about? Because I still, do not understand what we are called, what we call as a Brit American football. We don't call it football. We call it American football. I still don't understand it, and I can't see what all the fuss is about. But there we are. Let me tell you, 14th of October 1968 is a date that's, that's, that's in my mind that never goes away. It was my first working day in life. I had joined a bank. That was to be my career. I... Thanks, my, my parents were so relieved that I had actually decided that having been a failure at school and not getting any, any sufficient examination results to get to university, I had to, I had to get a job. So I worked, I got a job, applied for a job in a bank. Little did they know, of course, that the reason I went into banking was I thought they started work at 10 o'clock in the morning and they went home at three o'clock in the afternoon because that was when there were opening hours. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good job. I'll take that. So off I went and I started 
my first job in a place. I was in a branch of Barclays Bank in the, on the northeast of England, which was home to me, in called Seam Harbour. This sounds very idyllic. It sounds picturesque. It's a small town, a harbour, fishing boats, etc. Don't you believe it? It is in the heart of the coal mining part of the United Kingdom, which sadly is no, not there anymore. But it is a bleak place, the north of the northeast of England. It's on obviously it's on the north coast, uh, North Sea. It's on the coast. Um, in a good summer's day, it's sixty degrees. That's why I'm always so interested in uh, temperatures. On a good day, it's sixty degrees. It's typically grey skies, grey seas, and would you believe the sand is black? The reason why the sand is black is because it was coal mining. Coal mining was underground as they took it out. They sent all the waste out to sea because that was the best place to dump it. The only thing was the tide brought it back in. and We resulted in black sand. So it was a memorable place, but you, you get used to where you're living, really, don't you? I had my first job, my first piece of work in the bank was I had to stamp checks. There was a whole pile of checks and I had a rubber stamp, which I had to stamp, 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 stamp all morning because it said paid. They were yesterday's transactions to get paid. I had, I had to stamp them all morning. After lunch, I then had to put them in an alphabetical drawers in, in the customer name. The big challenge was no, no names on the checks. So you could only tell who had signed the check by the signature. And let's be fair, some people, in my mind, were very kind because what they did, they were quite good signatures. Others were just a scribble. And that was particularly challenging because this was my job because my next job was putting together bank statements. And in those days, you had a bank statement and you had to have all the checks. And if I was putting them in the wrong drawers and the wrong slots in the drawer, because I couldn't read the signature. Then it made the bank statement, this challenging part of work in my life, to be in, 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 a, in com complete chaos because I couldn't find the checks. You've got a picture now of banking in, in 1968. There was no automation, not one little bit. I prided myself because I learned through hard, hard work to be able to add, add up a long list of numbers in my, not in my head, but you know, just manually. And I remember one day a, a local director came to visit us. The, the classic visit by one of the directors was, well, as they walked in the door, uh, we're all doing a fine job, keep going. And that was his, that was his motivational speech to us all. But what he did say was, and, and I can remember, I can picture this, he said to us, why don't you get one of those calculators? They're awfully good. They help you to add up, and actually, they're not very expensive either. Why don't you get one? So out of a staff of 25 staff, they invested in one calculator amongst the staff, and day after day, and bear in mind, in those days, but before the currency in the UK was decimal, we had pounds, shillings, and pence. 12 pennies in a shilling and 20 shillings in a pound. It was doubly hard to add up long ranges of figures. I just did a job. I still had this passion for cricket. But gradually, I began to get interested in what banking was all about. I had to do bank exams. Why did I have to do bank exams? I left school, but there we had to do it. And now we know why. I found it interesting. I found it challenging. I found it very fascinating to learn all about banking. So I qualified as a banker within two or three years of joining this bank with, as I say, not automated, no nothing. Let me fast forward now 20 years on and I progressed at the bank and I was a corporate manager in the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. I got the usual phone call because that was the only way that anybody ever got another job. To move on, we had no control of our careers. I got this phone call, Please come to an interview in London. We want you to be a bank inspector in London. I didn't know anything about being a bank inspector, except one thing, nobody liked them. Nobody, everybody was scared of them. 
And I thought, wow, what's that like? What, what's all that about? I didn't know anything about it. Anyway, I had I took that job. We still weren't, as, a, as an inspection team, we weren't automated until one day we were given a laptop. I had a team of eight people working for me and we got one laptop. And we couldn't understand why we wanted it because all we did was type in there. And we put in there our reports. And I remember wisely saying, which was not very impress impressive as I look back, we say, well, why don't we just carry the, the secretary around with us in the car and she can type as we're doing our work. Little did we know where we were moving to. My boss was even more switched off to the technology. He called his laptop a shelf top. He put it on top of the shelf and he left it there. Never touched it. It gathered dust. Couldn't see why we should have it. So those were the banking days I, I, introduced, I was introduced to. But then a massive change in my life because, again, the phone rang and I was asked to go to an interview to be a resident inspector for Barclays Bank in the Caribbean. Again, never been to the Caribbean, didn't know anything about it, about working overseas. All I can recall is, for the first time in my life, I was, I was, I was actually paid to fly in club class across the Atlantic from London Heathrow to Miami. I did that and then got on a tiny little plane to get from Miami to Nassau, my introduction to life in the Carib Caribbean. But what the interesting thing was, we were inspectors. We All we did was we looked at piles and piles of, of, of uh, records, had to check them all off, had they been properly signed. And if you found out that one out of a thousand hadn't been signed, you wrote it up in the inspection report. It was very routine. But then we eventually, it moved on and became internal auditors. And that sounded very grand, rather inspective, rather than inspector and not how we would be involved and anybody would not like us. Well, I, that was a, a myth anyway. They never liked us, didn't matter what the name was. But again, I became fascinated. This is a boy who had no interest in study. I became fascinated internal auditing. I qualified as an internal auditor because I, I found that doing the work was good to get the background. So, but I can remember distinctly that the chief inspector and I had a conversation by phone. He was in London. I was in, in, in Nassau talking about passing the exams. And it's very words where I, I take my hat off to you. At your age, you've sat down and you've qualified. You've studied in examinations and you've qualified as an internal auditor. He said, at your age, I'm thinking to myself, I was 50 years old. I began to think, well, this is how Barclays Bank is viewing me. We all know, I think the audience, all of us here, realize, and I realize this, that 50 years old, I didn't think it at the time, but I was a young man. But it was almost like I was on a slippery slope to, to go downwards and no longer, be no longer be needed in this big, wide world of banking. But there I was in, in Nassau, and I had a, I had a small team of, of, of uh, local staff, Bahamians, who worked for me, and it was quite an eye-opener. I learned a lot in a, in, in a very short time about recognizing to have patience, to have an understanding of the culture, and to realize that I am not working in the UK, sorry, the, I'm not working equipment in the UK, but it just the sun shines. It is not like that. You are a guest in somebody else's country, and you have to mold yourself to live that and be, be respectful of being in a different country. I learned that very, very quickly. The only difference with the team that I had, they were very, very willing, very helpful, and very committed. Their only challenge was they weren't as, had the same opportunities to be a bit more worldly wise than I brought to the table. I could give you lots and lots of stories of my life as an inspector. We were in 14 different countries in the Caribbean. I visited all of them many times. I can remember in the Eastern Caribbean, particularly, one of, one of the stories I want to share with you is that we had the, the, the airline that flew around, the local airline that flew around the Caribbean was notorious for never getting anywhere on time, never taking off on time, leaving time. It was called, the, the airline was called Liat, L-I-A-T, or more commonly called by all of us travelers as leave island anytime. Or we used to also say, 
luggage left in any terminal. They just couldn't operate. I remember one, one, air, one time when we flew from Antigua to Barbados and we were up and down six times. Each time, as we took off again, because we stayed on the plane, because they picked two people got off, two people got on, off, off they went. And they had to do the safety, the, the flight attendant had to do the safety uh, talk. And this was six times we had this, so much so that every time we said it, you, we were all bored stiff with it. The flight attendant, you could tell she was bored with it. And what, my colleague sitting next to me says, why doesn't she say, Anybody who doesn't know the, the safety routine, put the hands up. And then if, if nobody put their hands up, she wouldn't say it. She wasn't very impressed with that suggestion, of course. But anyway, here we go. We, I, was, I was in the Caribbean for two to three years. That was my sign of my assignment, time of my assignment. Ten years later, I was still there, but bad news. Head office found me and said, look, you've had a good enough time you've got to come back to the UK. I went back to the UK, and as soon as they said I was in the Caribbean for 10 years, they thought palm trees, beaches, pina colada, you're out of the loop now. So I was no way I was going to get a job in, in Barclays Bank again in the UK, and I did some contract work for myself. But I always had a yearning for the Caribbean. Turks and Caicos was always a good stop in the tours we did. It was pleasant. We would do a five-week stint, not going home at weekends. It was always a good, it was always a good stop. I had the opportunity to get a job. Uh, from the UK, I had a contact who was starting up a bank in Turks and Caicos. I had the opportunity. I got a job in the Turks and Caicos. Uh, and but sadly, the bank didn't last very long. Didn't, nobody lost any money, but it, it just couldn't compete in that environment. Then I became a regulator. Didn't know anything about regulation. But there we are. It was the only job I could get. Either that, I would have to go back to this cold, cold, unpleasant northeast of England compared to the idyllic Caribbean. But I was tasked with setting up an anti-money laundering regime for the country in the Turks and Caicos Islands. I developed a small team, first one person, two people, three people. Same again, very willing, very keen, very, very watching, wanting to learn. Again, very little worldly wide opportunities for them. But again, I got into this mindset. I wanted to understand about all this money laundering. So I qualified as an anti-money laundering specialist. I was 62 at that time. I qualified through examinations. I put myself now in the, in the, in the category of a lifelong learner because from being hopeless at school, every step of the way, when I look back at my career, and I, I believe I have three different careers of banking, internal auditing, and now in regulation, that opportunity to learn and I, I really am grateful and I, that I'm completely inspired. I want to tell you now about how did I end up standing here talking to you. I logged into a webinar which I saw was being facilitated by Derek Arden who we, are, we know as a member of the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. I thought I know him, I remembered him from Barclays Bank Training Centre and believe it or not, it was 40 years ago, but I tapped in, in, in into the chat before the meeting had started and said, Derek, I remember you from Chester House at Wimbledon. Derek immediately shouted out, Limey, in, his, in his, 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 his southern accent, there's somebody just contacted me who's been, who knew me 40 years ago. I can't believe it in Barclays Bank. And he tells me he's from Turks and Caicos. How the heck did he get there? He talks about anti-money laundering. And would you believe, that, and this is the, this is the, the joint where I became involved, our dear, my dear friend, our dear friend, Patricia Fripp, was listening to this conversation and she heard two things, money laundering, Turks and Caicos Islands. And she immediately interrupted this little banter between Derek and I to say, 
I think you would be a good person to come and talk to us about money laundering in the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. Here I am, these, one of these chance opportunities that you ever come across, and you can't foresee it, you can't manufacture it. But what I have learned is it fits my lifestyle. The, 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 the Golden Gate Breakfast Club and Derek Garden's Monday Night Club is this lifelong learning. I have learned so much from interesting speakers in all walks of life. I still don't understand American football, I'm sorry to say, but apart from that, I have learned so much and by this chance meeting. So as I say, education is wasted on the young. George Bernard Shaw. Never a truer word has been said. Over to you, Mr. President. Wow. Thank you, Paul. You've had quite the career. Okay, but I have a question for you to start off our questions, okay? And um, so who's your, what's your favorite cricket team? Favorite cricket team, I would say, Embarrassingly, I would say it always has been Yorkshire in the first class uh, cricket team. But they, of course, they're under complete fire now for racial uh, intimidation with one of their, and, and it's uh, in the last four or five months about, because of course it's very multicultural cricket in the UK now in England. And they're, they're under fire for uh, uh, racial intimidation. But Yorkshire is, a, is just, that's it. There's so many stories about Yorkshire cricket. Oh, all right. What are the questions we have for Paul? No. Oops. I see Brian. Brian, you're, you've got your hand up, and then Patricia. Bill Buchanan. And Bill Buchanan. Yeah, Paul, I'm, I'm fascinated. Oh, I'm fascinated by your story there because I think. There's certain times in life when you get that call and that call can change your life and your circumstances. So I was just a little bit curious. Did you plan to go to Nassau or was it just a chance event no. or did it was complete? <laughs> it was complete chance. It was complete chance. And, and, and literally, uh, I mean, and it's hard to look back and say that we had absolutely no control over your, your career, really. You just waited for the phone to ring. Anybody who left Barclays Bank <laughs> in my younger days, was considered a trader. You know, the banking was for life. That's how they sold it to us. They didn't say that it was a bit of a boring, you know, progression, but uh, uh, which is true sometimes, but not all the times. But no, I had no idea that was there was an opportunity. I applied for the job. The irony is that uh, I was taught about the job, asked about the job for two days. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my wife. Uh, and and uh, and I, we were living in Surrey at the time, and I went home one night and said, you know what, there's a job in, in, in the Bahamas. I said, but, you know, children at school, we've just moved from Edinburgh, you know, all this people can't do it. So she said to me, well, why don't you apply for it? So I applied for it, got the job, and of course, no, mo no mobile phone sense. So I found a phone book, a phone, phone booth, called her, and told her, I said, I've got the job. She said, oh, I didn't think you'd get it. And... <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. But anyway, to 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 her credit, she did join me in um, uh, in in the Bahamas. But uh, it, it is, you know, and for a variety of reasons, it is a tough life for the wife of an expatriate because they can't work. Um, you know, and I travel a lot. But you know, that's where the world goes round. I must admit, I I relate very much to that because one wet February in England when I was about thirty. I went into WH Smith's and got the Times Educational Supplement. I always like to look in there for overseas jobs and just for a laugh, almost as a as an exercise, I applied for a job in Bermuda and I certainly didn't think that I was going to get it, but uh, I did. And um, yeah, it was. A, and I lived in Surrey as well at the time. So oh, really, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's a Early small world. Yes, yeah. So that was. When you get that call, it really does change your life and circumstances. So, well, it has. It, it, it has. I mean, because I just can't believe that I've been here so long. Yeah. I think once expatriates move, if they can deal with the, the, the new culture and a new environment, then they stay. Many don't stay. I remember when I got my first pay paycheck and I said, yeah, 
it's really true. We don't pay any income tax then. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. But just Thanks. to spoil it for everybody else, we pay income, we pay duty on anything that's imported of 37.5%. Mm -hmm. So that's how the government raises its money. So everything that you buy in, in uh, the States for, you know, so much add on another 37.5% to the price plus shipping. Wow. Still not complaining. Uh, Patricia, you're up. Well, it's very interesting, uh, Paul, to hear stories of England as it used to be. I also didn't do that well at school. However, I now realize how good a basic British education was years ago when I correct the grammar of my very prestigious executive clients. I also used to find cricket very exciting as we followed our home team. But I'm glad through Derek, uh, our connections, and you've become a valuable contributor to our club. So mm -hmm. I loved your stories. And I would just like to give a shout out because he must have arrived late. But our friend Brian Wagner from Ohio is joining us. And we haven't seen him for a long time because he's been quite busy in his career. But anyway, Paul, wonderful hearing your stories. And, you know, England was so different that many years ago. It might interest you to know that my brother bought the building next to his house. And it was Barclays Bank. And that is, he's building it into his office. It's spectacular. So back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Patricia. And thank you for introducing Brian. So it's a, always a pleasure to have Brian join us. Mr. Wink himself. <laughs> okay, uh, Antonio, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. President. So what an incredible uh, group of presentations we have here. Uh, before I ask my question, because we're running, uh, well, are we going to do our traditional? Uh, uh... Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Right, so right, great. Yeah. so we have, okay. why don't you go ahead and ask your question and then let's move, we'll move on to that. How's that sound? Great, thank you, Mr. Right. President. So, so two stories of people uh, traversing the continent into new areas and tra traversing uh, uh, time and space and 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 uh, and the sea to to join us here in the states and in and in the in the islands. Uh, my question uh, for for you is going to be, Paul, um, what is it about home that you miss the most, other than cricket here, and how are you able to sustain it? Uh, where you're currently living here on the island. Is there, is there a home treat, a home food, uh, a, a home, uh, some sort of uh, element from home that you bring to you uh, uh, on the islands currently? Okay. I, w I think that uh, probably um, very few people will know what I'm talking about when I say pork pies. Um, <laughs> because pork pies are just, it's, a, it's pretty unhealthy. But it's it's this it, it, it's it's a pastry with as you can imagine it's processed pork inside full of the the fat or, or in the form of jelly because it's you 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 tend to eat them cold and but they just taste superb and uh, but perhaps it's a good idea that I'm not in the UK because I probably would be eating far too many but when I do go back pork pies and uh, you can't get pork pies here I don't think you can get them in the US. Tiny little things. I think that's that's the life of an expatriate. It's the, it's it's not necessarily the big things. It's just these little little things. You remember, like mince pies. I bought mince pies at the at the supermarket the other day. It cost an absolute fortune, but that's Christmas. As a student, I once worked over for a week in a pork pie factory, so I have happy memories <laughs> of pork pies. So you know how the sausage is made. <laughs> I was in the big pie section. You know? <laughs> Well, okay, guys. Oh, oh, I, have to add, I have to edit it. Now we yeah. talk about pork pies. Here's a funny little piece of trivia. In high school, I played Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of the Barbary Coast, who was famous for his meat pies. I'll leave it at right. that. 